Welcome into another edition of the Breaking News Team here on KC Sports Network. I am Joshua Briscoe alongside Kent Swanson to tell you that there is Chiefs news today as they have reportedly inked Tershawn Wharton to a one-year fully guaranteed deal that we'll get into some of the details of here momentarily. Thanks for following along, watching uh, the video on the KCSN socials, following along there as well. Kent, today I am hosting in this circumstance because I have a sport coat and you're in a polo, so Tucker said that meant I could host today and now you do the analysis this is the closest thing to dressed up you're gonna get out of me i'm sorry you know like T craig and maddie dress up for tro trophy day on you know, on mm. super bowl sunday with the full suits i have bypassed that entirely i don't even try this is about as fancy as you're gonna get out of me i'm sorry you you look like if an emergency uh golf uh outing broke out you would be there in a heartbeat uh, but I have I have put a blazer on over my white T-shirt to show that I do respect the urgency and the newsworthiness of Tershawn Wharton coming back to Kansas City. Um, this has been an incredibly quiet first several days of free agency for the Chiefs, and three of their like five or six real moves have been on the interior defensive line. Chris Jones got the bag, Mike Pinnell is back, and now Jordan Schultz first to report that Tershawn Wharton is re-signing with the Chiefs on a one-year $2.75 million dollar fully guaranteed deal um first thought best thought can't what went through your mind when you saw one year almost three million dollars for Tershawn Wharton I think there's a slight bet on you know him continuing to return to the form that he had before his injury I think last year hit you know he was kind of getting his feet wet yet again uh but you know I I, I like it I think it's a, a strong solid move to continue to insulate your defensive line I actually wonder if they're not done with the defensive line it's just checking a box and moving on i think they might they may not may not need, really need to make any other moves of significance along the interior like if you told me that they're rolling out with chris tershawn and you know whoever wins the battle between neil farrell isaiah bugs mike pinnell you know if, if that's your five even i i think you know you can totally you can totally roll with something like that so uh, yeah, I'm, I am I like what they did, and I mean, Ooh. he's a good football player. Uh-oh, I heard another voice. I don't see another face, but I heard another voice. Uh, is that Maddie Lane's bare shoulders? It sure is. What's, uh, what's Matt, going on, I'll, fellas? I'll give more details again here in a second. There's a little contractual thing that's interesting, and I do want to know what you guys think about the draft class in the interior because, Kent, as you said, this is like a tall enough to ride interior defensive line group potentially at this point, but... With uh, Chris Jones being the exception, everybody else is uh, only on one-year deals. I guess Neil Farrell's continues. Is it one more year after that? They, they acquired his rookie contract. I'm not sure where exactly his cuts off. Um, do you remember, Kent? You look like He's, you're about to correct Neil me. Farrell has two years remaining on his rookie contract. Right so now, okay. He was, yes, so they, he has two years remaining on that. So Farrell's through this year and next. The rest of that group all on one-year deals. Matt, when you saw this deal come down, what was your thought about $3 million fully guaranteed for Turk Wharton? So my initial thought was, whoo, that eats a good chunk into what the Chiefs currently have available. Um, now it sounds like they might be getting to play around with the numbers a little bit and reduce the hit, which I think we're getting to in a second. But yeah, that was my first thought was, hey, I'm glad Tershawn Wharton's back. That fills the need of a kind of backup to Chris Jones as your you know, pass rushing, the backup three tech. I like Tershawn Wharton. He made some big plays for the Chiefs. All this is good. But then I was like, ooh, fully guaranteed almost $3 million dollars. That's that's eaten pretty deep into the space that the Chiefs have left. So I am glad that it seems like there might be some uh, some wiggle room that they have found here to make that more palatable for the amount of space that they have right now. Yeah, I haven't seen Bearcat tweet about this yet, who I was going to specifically wait to, to hear from to see if he had any further details on this. But uh, Truman Chief on Twitter noted that this will be the Chiefs' four-year qualifying money, so Tershawn Wharton should have a cap hit of $1.29 million while making $2.74 million. Uh, veteran salary benefit, I think, is the official phrasing from the NFL side, like a mid-level exception type of thing on the, on the basketball side. Basically, a way to incentivize, I think, kind of guys in that veteran window to lower the cap hit for the Chiefs. So that, that to me, made it a little bit easier, not not easier to stomach. I wasn't sick to my stomach when I saw 3 million, but to Matt's point, one and a half million for Tershawn Wharton for one more year feels like a totally reasonable investment. It's not really doing much of anything against the cap. You know, it's, it's cutting that caps, you know, that, that cap hit in half and yeah. Hey, look, it's a hey, credit for, uh, you know, 
Clark Hunt for throwing three million dollars at uh, at Treshawn Wharton, right? You know, so but no, I, I I don't think that was really all that much of a consideration when consider when kind of deciding what to do with a Treshawn Wharton. And if that's the case, look, I I think you know, I don't know if last year was his best year, but he's come like again coming off an injury you know if he regains a little bit more of the explosiveness that we've seen out of him in years prior this could be a really nice little upside play not that he was bad last year by any stretch of the word but i don't think he had the same level of change of direction ability explosiveness watching him drop in coverage every now and then when steve spagnola <laughs> would do it like two years ago versus last year it's a little bit different but i i still like yeah if, if he can regain some of that athleticism even more as he gets back from that, like he's a good football player and he's been a good contributor to this team. He's been a great value as in uh, an undrafted free agent over the last couple of years. Yeah. And so like, it's the kind of perfect guy that you bring back, especially when you can figure out the numbers to where it essentially has no impact on what the cap space is going to be. So now the chiefs are kind of like, can he run? Listen, he, he might, <laughs> I, he might compared to some of the other guys they have. He might, um, he's an can, he run the is, full, the, the, can he run the whole route tree from derp frog? Thank you. Derp frog. Great question. Oh man. So yeah. So they, they bring back to Sean Wharton. I like this move again to everyone's point. The money's good. He fits in with what the team has. And I think now, if you look at the whole picture, they probably have rounded out the majority of their defensive tackle like room. That room is yes. probably pretty full. There's still maybe they could use maybe another body at some point in time. Maybe they're going to add some defensive ends, whether the draft or in free agency, but they've kind of squared away. There's now about four, five guys in the defensive tackle room that you kind of anticipate fighting for snaps with Chris Jones, the signing of Wharton, Mike Pinnell coming back, Isaiah Bugs being brought back on a futures, the little extra cash thrown in, and then Neil Farrell, who they traded for. That's a that's probably your five man rotation the D tackle spot. They probably got that figured out right now, which opens them up to the defensive end or the rest of the defense. Kent. Well, and I we were talking about that a little bit before you got here, Maddie. So thank you for rehashing something in the seven minute podcast that we've had. I know you. There's no way you could have known. Uh, but like the Chiefs have done a good job of going cheap around Chris Jones. So if you look at the roster construction for the interior of, of the defensive line. They're not making any big expenses outside of what they've paid Chris Jones, which, which makes a ton of sense. You know, obviously if you're going to go big and throw a big cap hit and a lot of cash at one singular player, it makes sense to go on the cheaper side building around him. And so Isaiah bugs, Mike Pinnell are on, uh, you know, league minimum contracts. Neil Farrell still on his rookie deal. And now Tershawn Warden essentially, you know, making a little bit more money than a, a veteran minimum deal. Like you've, you've given yourself a solid interior defensive line, uh, a capable interior defensive line, and you've basically only allocated the resources to essentially one player. So I do like that the Chiefs have kind of gone this route. It's not all that surprising considering, you know, if you look at a big picture roster construction perspective, it makes sense that they would try to do something like this. This is these are the kind of areas where you just kind of stay in a in a in a contained box outside of what you're doing with Chris, so you can allocate the limited resources elsewhere to help improve the roster. We're fudging the math on this a little bit by design, but they actually might have one of the cheapest defensive tackle groups in football this <laughs> year in particular, wow. since Chris Jones's cap hit is so low. It's what like seven some million six six seven eight somewhere in that in that range. Well, and, and actually, if you want to extend it at the entirety, not just the interior defensive line, yeah. if you add the 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 contracts of the edge rushers too, yeah, they've mm -hmm. got some first round contracts on there. They've got, but Charles Amani, he's on, he's not the most expensive player. Like he didn't sign a massive deal, you know. Like they've actually Malik Herring on the cheaper side too. I think if you yeah do the math on the entirety of that defensive line, not just the interior, you might be right, Josh. I well, and then so. half the secondary, half the secondary is also on rookie deals, but yeah. yet they have no cap space. It's a, it's, it's a wild time. Like, yeah, you got to start, like, you start digging deep into it. It's just kind of funny that, yeah, you guys are right. The defensive line as a whole is going to be one of the cheaper in the NFL. The secondary as a whole. Now, Legereus Steve being on the tag right now eats deep or like adds a lot to the secondary, but everybody outside of him is pretty cheap as well. So it's just, it's funny how they also are running out of space despite having two position, two whole like parts of the defense on such cheap deals. I don't know, Maddie. I, I can't think of any reason why this team would, uh, 
I, I couldn't. Oh, you have 50. Oh, OK. Yeah. I, yeah. No, we're we're all thinking the same thing, which is that twenty seven million dollars for Joe Tooney this year really does kind of stink. Right. Is that what we were all thinking? Because, yes, um, yes, Mahomes, Mahomes at 37, Tooney at 27. Jawan Taylor is, is going to get close to 25 this year. Sneed holding at about 20. Kelsey at 15. Justin Reed at about a little over 14. And then Charles Aminahu is actually he actually has a larger cap hit than Chris Jones this year uh, coming in at just yeah. under 11 million. We'll see, of course, if they end up doing anything with Aminahu. He's clearly um, campaigning for a new deal. I don't know if the Chiefs are in that headspace or not. Um, two two guys that I wonder if this impacts you. Kind of, you've kind of, and I we are still gonna. I'm gonna to pick your brains about the draft class some to some extent also. Yeah. But the one that seems relatively obvious, even though he doesn't play precisely the same position as Tershawn Wharton. Feels like this is probably the end of the road for Derek Noddy, right? Um, not necessarily new players from last year uh, around him. Pinnell was a practice squad guy all year. Um, and I guess Bugs on this futures deal. I think his is technically a futures deal. Um, but it it seems like I know I think both you guys were kind of thinking that last year might not have been a, a return case for Derek Noddy. At this point, I'm sure he'll have a, a very, very late free agent market wait for everything else to kind of settle in uh, obviously coming off an injury as well doesn't help so does this feel like the end for Derek Naughty in your guys's estimation so I'm not entirely sure that this this ushers in the end of the Derek Naughty era last year he signed late March and last year I believe he signed on essentially a, a veteran minimum deal yep. and you know those veteran min minimum deals sometimes they don't have any guaranteed cash essentially towards them or very limited amounts of guaranteed cash associated with them so if you told me that the chiefs brought derek Nottie back to compete with neil farrell and mike pinnell you know and, and to, to kind of keep that uh and isaiah bugs like i mean I, I think we're treating isaiah bugs as a lock even like i think he's played a lot of football in in the nfl he's played games before but if he's in the danny that, shelton mold right now for me like he's like the name we know we'd like to see play but may never actually get to see yeah and like i there's been you know there is a sample size of him playing and playing some capable football but i think the chiefs could roll out with isaiah bugs and i would totally understand it but if you told me that the Chiefs are going to give Derek Nottie another veteran minimum and he's in camp and they're going to compete, those four are really mm -hmm. going to kind of fight it out. That wouldn't surprise me either. Like, I think you could walk into the 2024 season with the group that they have now, which is always a good thing and something Brett Beach likes to accomplish, you know, for the entirety of his roster before the draft. But yeah, I, I don't think it's necessarily the end for Derek Nottie. I think there's still a chance that he could eventually come back on a, on another veteran minimum deal. Yeah, so last year they signed him on a vet minimum deal. It was fully guaranteed last year. So I'm not saying that that means it would be for sure this year, right. but it was last year. And I think you go into maybe get into camp a little bit and see how it's playing out. Um, see if Pinnell's in shape to what you think will be for a whole year. Remember, you know, every other time they've brought him in, it's been down later in the stretch. So do they feel comfortable with him having to play the entire season before the playoffs? Is Neil Farrell making the jumps that you thought? Here was a guy that was essentially a healthy inactive or, you know, inactive for the most of the year, barely got any playing time. You traded for him, so you have high hopes, but what is he showing you? And then with Bugs, same thing. I think Bugs' contract actually is probably going to be higher than what they paid Derek Naughty last year. I, I think if the, with the extra mm. money they threw at it, so I think that he, he's getting a little bit. It doesn't mean it's a guarantee to Kent's point. There is no guarantee that he's on the roster or going to play. It's just they've thrown the same amount of money essentially at this nose tackle position that they normally do that they feel pretty good with. So I think they will probably roll into camp with what they have. Maybe Derek Naughty is this year's Mike Pinnell. He comes on in the mm. middle of the year because he's sitting on another team's practice squad or another team cuts him late in the year because he's just not getting any run. I don't know. So I'm not willing to say it's the end, but I think it's a, a, unlikely that he is like an ad, addition to this squad before camp starts. On, I, I think it's also and worth mentioning. Sorry, Josh. I mean, Mike Pinnell played three games last season and then the playoffs. It's not yeah, like they were all he, it was his maximum number of practice squad elevations. He, he was and, never on the active roster last year. And so if, if you want to look at the last since 2019, here's the number of games that Mike Pinnell has played. 18, 14, 10, 17, and 3. So I don't, and this, I know I, it sounds like I'm saying, speaking out of both sides of my mouth, but I, I I think you could roll into this season no problem with this group. I still feel good and comfortable with where they sit. But that I don't think it precludes them from adding a Derek Nottie into the mix. I think if there's a, if it's a low stakes veteran minimum deal and he comes back, 
I I fully support it. I think it's a great idea. But you can poke some holes in you can poke some holes in this group to say, you know, maybe just have a little bit additional insurance is probably a better way of putting, even though I think I like what I've seen out of Neil Farrell. Obviously, like what we saw out of Mike Pinello at the best game of his career the last time we saw him. And Isaiah Bugs has had a productive, good NFL career for what he's been asked to do. So uh, I just, yeah, I, I think you can make a case to continue to find no stakes kind of moves like a Derek Naughty the same way they did last year, potentially. So with that in mind, looking ahead to the draft a little bit, those guys are, we're talking about older vets on one-year deals and Chris Jones and Neil Farrell. Um, and uh, Wharton is a younger vet on a one-year deal. But in all of those spots, what does the defensive tackle class look like to you guys right now? Is there a, a pocket? Is it in day two or day three where you say, oh, there's some there's some talent here? Obviously, they drafted Keandre Coburn last year, and that didn't last in Kansas City. I actually can't even, is he still in Tennessee, maybe? Um, I'm not so. sure he, he, he ended up in Denver for like three weeks and then back out and, and the whole thing bounced around. But, um, is, is there a spot you think for a long-term investment? And if, if you're looking at it from your guys' perspective, I don't know where the, uh, where the KCSN draft guide pre-order link is right now, but, uh, you can find it pretty much anywhere on KCSN socials. What, what do you see in the defensive tackle group? And is there, is there a somewhat premium investment like there was a reportedly nate had, had reported that there was some interest in mozzie smith last year is there a chance of some premium investment at defensive tackle or now that they've locked up chris jones is it hey just just find yourself a role player in day three somewhere and, and have a guy under control for longer i think the the jones signing and then as well i mean everyone's on a one-year deal but they don't need anybody to come in and play significant snaps this year so between the chris jones signing that is you know, long term for whatever that can be in the nfl terms and kind of having some guys around i don't anticipate them going with a, you know uh, a high draft pick at the defensive tackle position and i think the D tackle position is not, I don't want to say deep, but deeper than it is strong at the top. I think it's kind of Byron Murphy at the top and then it's out of Texas. And then there's a drop off. And then there's just a group of guys that all belong in round two, maybe into round three. And if the chiefs get a really good value there, maybe, but if not, I think you just push it off to the middle rounds. You hope to find a guy that isn't as, as Keandre Coburn was very much a nose tackle. He was a run stuffing nose tackle, very unidimensional. You try to find somebody that can do a little bit of everything. Maybe you can develop as you don't need him to go out there and play right away. And you might be able to find a little bit of value in these middle rounds because there's like a probably 10 defensive tackles that are somewhere going to be in between round two and in round five. And one of those guys probably makes a little bit of sense to get in the room when you don't need them to play right away. The Johnny Kent, before Newton. Before you get to, yeah, shut up, Kent. Shut up, shut up. You guys can both mute yourselves if you want. I'll handle this. You ever have the worst news of all time broken to you by the worst person to ever possibly break it to you? The Cats brothers have tweeted that Jody Fortson signing with the Miami Dolphins. Oh, the devastation. Was jo I didn't know Jody Fortson was a Cats eight brother eight client. I didn't know that. I'm, I'm, do you need a minute, Josh, to kind of sulk? No, Nate mentioned it on Weird Games yesterday, and we'll do the we'll do Weird Games in like two hours. He said it probably was the end of the line for Jody Foster in Kansas City, and that's a that's that's something that we've been dealing with as a show for a very long time. But simultaneously being reminded that Jody for that Jody Fortson is a Cats Brothers client and that he's leaving our lives in this sense is flatly devastating. I, I'm surprised the. Cats brothers didn't try to parlay the Chris agreement into getting Jody a little bit of money guaranteed from the Chiefs too. You know, hey, look, you know, I you know, know how bad the Cats brothers had to bleep up to get me to turn against Jody Fortson even a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, uh, that's you not guys usually surprising. That Irv, guy. Irv Smith, yeah, man, he was a he's a Times R's legend and a Chiefs preseason legend and um and a great story and and maybe maybe he'll he'll be able to stay healthy and. I, I bet that Miami would find a use for him if he can make it onto the field. So, um, yeah, that's just the Chiefs hey. didn't tender him. They had a chance to. They decided not to and then brought in Irv Smith. So that, that writing was on the wall, but it's official now, according to the Cranch Brothers. And Irv Jody. Smith has dominated Chiefs Twitter all morning long. There has been He's the only Irv. thing they've done in two days. Every 15 minutes, there's a new Irv Smith picture or video coming out at you. So, you know, you knew, yeah. it, you knew it was wraps at that point in time. I'm going to get back to the defensive tackle 
uh, I, conversation, I mean, if, must. If, if that's okay. I do want to just no. pivot really quick to go back to you, Yeah, go ahead. Give your stupid draft tag. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Eat Arby's. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give him a, the a greatest. Chance. Kit, the greatest number 88 in Chiefs history is gone, and you want to talk about the defensive tackle class? If you want to talk about Jody Fortin's, Jody, Jody Fortin's fit in Miami, I do think some of that fast motion kind of out to outside the numbers, the, the, best, the, play, the, <laughs> the best play of Jody Fortin's career <laughs> was a similar motion where they got him fast <laughs> out and then started getting up the field vertically and made a play at the catch point, and that's basically been it. Um Sorry, that I'm just rubbing salt on a wound. But hey, look, Miami likes to do stuff like that similarly. So maybe they saw something in him there that was like, oh, that might work. Um, one thing I think to note about the defensive tackle position too is I think the Chiefs have felt comfortable cycling through some of these low value guys historically too, right? They are not uncomfortable having their nose tackle on a one year deal. In fact, it's been a lot of that over the last couple of years. They're just adding guys, they're adding bodies, they're adding guys late sometimes. Hello, Mike Pinnell. So I don't know if it's going to be too high of a priority for them to make sure that they have more than one defensive tackle. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm, I thought I was the one getting choked up. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm still processing the emotions of losing Jody Fortnite. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I it, that just seems like a position they feel comfortable just getting bodies. And there's there seems to be a... Uh, a plethora of nose tackle type players always available to you know to to sign at any given time hello mike pinnell so yeah i that, i think that's just a pr an approach so i don't know if they're going to prioritize the defensive tackle position at all in the draft it depends on how many picks they have um it, it's not it, it's fine to take a swing late but i don't think it's going to be in the first two or three days unless it's just great value uh, last thing for you guys here, and then we've crossed a 20 minute mark. I think we've done our Tershawn Wharton breaking yes. news time. Um, but there is there is really only one Chiefs free agent who I'm a little surprised we haven't gotten news about yet, given the, the caliber of player that he is and the caliber of the other guys that have probably got to have their markets weighed out a little bit. I haven't really seen or heard anything about Mike Dana to this point. Um, I I know it's I know he's not a true interior defensive lineman, but certainly the Chiefs have flexed him in there a lot and he's been good in that role. Do you guys have any feel whatsoever right now with it. The fact that he hasn't latched on, didn't latch on in the tampering period or in this first couple of days, I'm sure the Chiefs would like to have him back. I thought his market would probably get him a little deal by now. Where are you at right now on the Mike Dana front? So talking about the D-line. That the NFL rarely values the Chiefs free agents when they hit the market. I mean, just, mm -hmm. you know, it's year after year. When the Chiefs free agents kind of hit the market, they kind of linger for a while. Teams seem hesitant to want to pay the players that are walking away from the Chiefs, which is also like interesting because the Chiefs don't really pay guys long term either, right? The Chiefs don't keep a lot of guys in long term. A lot of guys cycle through and just other teams usually aren't ch chomping at the bit to bring them in. So I'm not surprised that Mike Dana has not got signed a deal yet. I am a little surprised there's been no buzz about him. You kind of look around. There's other defensive ends that fit the same mold, like a DJ Wanham, who's going on visits around the NFL right now, trying to convince teams, you know, hey, I'm your guy. And then obviously there's the more known players like Chase Young and Javion Clowney who are better, but like these guys are all going through the visit process. We're in phase two. This is where now as a player, you have to go visit teams to get them to sign you. And you just haven't heard anything about Mike Dana at all. So yeah, the longer it goes, the more likely I assume he is to come back to Kansas City on a one-year deal like they usually like to do for the defensive line position. And that would be great. Like that's going to, at this point in time, we're nearing where it's probably going to be great value to bring Dana back as a fan, as what's best for the team. Fingers crossed. That's what we're hoping for. As like, you know, rooting for him as the person, I hope somebody actually pays him, but it's just the longer it goes, I don't know if it's going to happen. It's like, remember when we heard Demarcus Robinson was getting $10 million a year in, in the open market, and then he signed for, I, I think he might even sign back to the Chiefs on a vet minimum, vet minimum deal. Mike Dana's going to get paid somewhere. I don't think it just, it's just a matter of, is it going to be a multi-year deal? Is it going to be what he was hoping for? And if it's not what he's hoping for, I think that's when he ultimately winds up coming back to Kansas City. And yeah, I, he, he might be one of those players that's considered a little bit more valuable to the Chiefs than other teams. Like he could kind of fit into that mold. Sometimes that happens for certain guys. And sometimes they're just better fits with a singular organization or, you know, a few organizations. So I, I think that's worth 
paying attention to and it's kind of checking his market out. I'd love to see him back. I do want to say something really quick because I was really I was really hoping Maddie was going to take that first so I could listen to this clip. There is a I, I will just there there is a report that from Craig Carton that Don't. Mike Williams might sign with the Kansas City Chiefs or will be signing with the Kansas City Chiefs. We'll keep an eye on that one. Um is it even the real Craig Carton? Like, if it's I'm, definitely the real Craig Carton, I'm like, mm. it is. We'll, it we'll it is the real him. Um, but I did I listen to the clip. My first, I maintain my initial stance of. Mm. We'll see. I'm just saying that's something that if it's that worthy. does happen, the breaking news team will return for that for that we moment. Be here if for it, anything. We are we are I mean we're here for we're we're here for Turk Ward. Don't, we're here don't for basically you. a one year vet minimum deal. Like if 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 Patrick okay, Mahomes stubs his now. toe, we're gonna break live. Now I do let, let's ask one real quick question too, and then we can get out of here. Uh we'll leave it on a cliffhanger almost. If the Mike Williams news is true and we've seen C Turk Wharton sign for a a deal here, that means the ball's kind of moving a little bit here for the Chiefs, right? Like, do we anticipate more? Is just gonna a wave of moves are gonna start coming down the pike? Do they have some resolution with Legere Sneed's situation? Um, Hollywood Hollywood Brown potentially, like maybe that is signaling and ushering in, you know, a signal that there's 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 a wave of move coming. Wave of move. Coming. I would I say know. that that probably begins in about three hours, considering that only weird games will be starting in about two hours live on all of the same platforms you're currently watching this on. So it'll be me, Seth Kaiser, and Nate Taylor. We'll all go live at the exact same spots you're watching this. And of course, hitting the podcast feed after that wraps up. And we won't have a show again until Tuesday. Obviously, you guys in the lab will be able to go on Monday. So I would say that there will probably be some massive news that breaks shortly after Weird Games wraps up. Uh, but even if that happens, like you're seeing now, we'll be live if we have an excuse to, which um, I honestly, we could have gone live for realizing that Kent Swanson was saying that Craig Carton has a scoop. Like that to me was sort of breaking news uh, just about Kent. But, you know, we're, we're here now anyway. So. Um, I don't usually say the last thing on weird games. Usually Nate does. So both of you guys can take a swing at it. And then can't you can hit the big red button that says stop, I guess. I think I've done my job. Listen, are you going to end it while I'm talking? That's what I'm trying to figure out right now, can I? That seems, nah, you're not, you're not crafty enough for that. My, my thing is the Chiefs just bought themselves five hours, 36 hours of social bits with Tershawn Wharton signing. Nothing's <laughs> happening. They got 36 <laughs> hours of material locked and loaded now, baby. They're good to go. Oh, I really hope you're wrong. I know. Hey, look, I I hope we get some news soon. It's kind of been an anxious, uh, anxious couple uh, couple days. But hey, look, the Kansas City Chiefs are back to back Super Bowl champions. They got another 300 days at least guaranteed that they will be that. So I can live with that. That's going to do it for breaking news. Joshua Briscoe, Maddie Lane. Catch you later.